Rene Descartes had just finished an incredible meal, and he and his dinner guests moved to his study. Imagine, if you will, this study. Book-lined walls, kind of musky, a little dark, smoke-filled, cigar smoke, fancy cigar smoke. And Rene Descartes is sitting on a leather chair, a wingback chair, and he's very comfortable. And as he sits there kind of relaxing, getting ready to spend some more time with his dinner guest, his butler comes in. His butler says, Mr. Descartes, I have a fine tawny port for you and a cigar. Will you be having a cigar tonight with your port? And Rene Descartes looks up at the butler and says, I think not. And Rene Descartes disappears. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am your host for today, and you can call me Todd, but you don't call me near enough. You don't call me enough. I worry. I sit around and I worry. Hey, today's podcast is interesting. Um, today's podcast is a direct result of me thinking about something very important that I probably hadn't talked about before. And so I want to talk about it with you in pretty good detail. Hold on to your seatbelts. Take, uh, you know, a partial graduate credit for this podcast. It's a little discussion around academic theory, and it's a little journey through a cat that I think you should know. Um, in fact, a cat that I think is really important for you to know because his research is really fundamental to thinking about really how the world responds to itself. And if you're listening at all to behavioral economics or reading Kahneman, thinking fast, thinking slow, or, or Freakonomics, those kind of things, you're going to know really quickly that this guy is important, muy importante, as we would say. So sit back and relax. It's great here, man. November is on its way. Everything is happening. We're heading towards my favorite holiday of all, Thanksgiving. Uh, I love Thanksgiving. It's about giving thanks and not burdened with many other agendas. We could talk about that later, but that seems like that's more of a therapy discussion than anything else. But I always look forward to it as well. I hope everything's going well with you as the uh, – Years start screaming to an end. It's um, it's slowing down a little bit for me on purpose, so that's nice. I'm having a little bit more time to play around. And you can tell uh, probably in my voice that um, that's good. I, I hope everything is marvelous for you. I, I really do. L let's not um, chat much more and get into this podcast. I think you'll find this podcast um, interesting. Listen carefully. I'll be curious to see if it elicits comments from you. Without any further ado, um, let's just say this. Class is in session. So I realized kind of in the middle of the Andrew Barrett podcast, you remember that a couple weeks ago? I realized in the middle of that conversation that there's a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't told you about me, although most of the stuff I have told you about me, but I haven't told you about me as it relates to kind of the academic underpinning for all this work we do. And and that's neither really here nor there. It's not terribly important either way. But the the conversation with Andrew got kind of academic-y uh, in a little bit. And, and actually, there's a purpose to this conversation because I actually think this leads us into some pretty important information that I think I made the assumption that everyone kind of knows, and that was kind of a dumb assumption because not everyone knows that. And so let's talk a little bit about sort of the journey I went on because um, that's the question Andrew asked me, and, and I'll just kind of blab out my journey. So, so when I got my Ph.D., um, I studied with a guy named Everett Rogers. He he was uh, he he was my advisor. In fact, he was the chair of my committee, and so it was kind of a, it was more than just studying with him. Um, in a way, he kind of mentored me and led me and directed me, as much as they do that in a PhD program. PhD programs, you're pretty much it's it's a little bit sink or swim, but he was there for me, and worked diligently nights and weekends to make sure I finished. 
<laughs> which if you have an advanced degree, you know exactly what I just said. Um, it's easy to not finish. Plus, I think he was, he was, you know, tired of me. Get get him out of here. Get him out of here. And and Ev Rogers is is quite remarkable. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was an incredible scholar. And I'll bet you, you know him. You may not know him, but I'll bet you do know him. Because Ev Rogers, he wrote a lot of stuff, but the book that he's most famous for and has many, many versions of it, and it's out even today. In fact, a book that Malcolm Gladwell, who is no booger in uh, contemporary writing right now, a book that Malcolm Gladwell calls the very best example of academic research available, is a book called Diffusion of Innovation. And that was all Ev Rogers' work. Ev, his, his, he worked everywhere. He was at Stanford for a long time. Then he was the Annenberg Chair at USC. He, he's, he's, been, he's, he's quite an impressive scholar. He was quite an impressive scholar. But this book he wrote talks about how ideas are diffused. And the reason I say I think you know it is because I'll bet you've seen his work. So if you've ever seen a kind of an S curve that talks about how new ideas are generated and moved through organizations or societies or cultures, you, you, you've seen his work. And that S curve starts at the very bottom, the slowest people to, um, to actually take on new ideas. He called those people laggards. And then he moved up this S curve and the fastest people to take on new ideas he called early adopters. And so if you've heard those phrases and you've been in meetings where you hear about laggards and early adopters, that's all Rogers' work. And what Rogers studied was how ideas moved through organizations or through cultures or through countries. But he was really focused on on ideas. And he looked at really interesting things like hybrid seed corn, which actually is a really interesting um, set of data because most corn that's grown anywhere in the world is hybridized and how it was hybridized and how it diffused is, is actually kind of a fun thing to look at. You can kind of see who is brave and will try new ideas quickly and who's rather not brave, rather conservative, small C and, and waits longer until sort of the news is out and the jury's in before they make those, those, um, those decisions. Now that's kind of a really interesting part of our work because the way new ideas around safety and reliability move through organizations follows that diffusion curve. And so I've always been really interested in how this new view stuff moves and how it works. But that really is the start of where I wanted to go in this conversation because Ev Rogers, who would be my mentor, his mentor, really one of his strong men, he had two strong mentors that he liked very much. One was a guy named Thomas Kuhn, whom I've talked about on the podcast before, and I'm sure we'll talk about again. The other is a psychologist by the name of Kurt Lewin. And Kurt Lewin is probably who we should talk about today. And, and that, that's a long kind of convoluted way to get into a discussion around kind of what Andrew Bart and I were talking about and what you do for a living, and that is understanding how we get organizations to change. And if you know anything about Kurt Lewin, and you may know nothing, that's fine. He's, he was really famous as a researcher, as an academic, for his understanding and studying of groups of people. And in fact, he coined the phrase group dynamics. And, and what Lewin did was he looked at how groups were effective, how groups communicated with each other, how groups formed and what that forming looked like, and then how groups were led and, and what leadership for groups should look like. And he did all this work really early in the last century, and he collected a tremendous amount of information, and he studied pretty interesting stuff. We can talk about that later too. But, but what he looked at and formulated was a theory that, quite honestly, I think is fundamental to what we do. And it's the idea that Lewin had that how groups change really fits into sort of two distinct 
categories. There are two ways people move, two forces that move people towards new thinking, new ideas, a change, paradigm shift, new philosophy, whatever word you want to call it. And Lewin's premise is, is that there are either driving forces or restraining forces. Now, if you remember Aubrey Daniels' work, or if you remember the behavioral-based safety training you took where they did the, the, the antecedent behavior consequence, the ABC model, you'll kind of know a little bit about Lewin's early work because he said people are either moving towards something or moving away from something. And that notion that these two forces coexist, that's how people change their minds. That's how new knowledge is diffused, to use Roger's terms. And that's how philosophies change. And really what we are um, as safety professionals, as reliability professionals, we're change agents. And, and so Lewin's work becomes really fundamental. And, and if you don't know it, well, Lewin's major premise is, is that, and it's kind of non-intuitive. So his, his research findings were not what you think they are. In, in fact, if you look at behavioral-based safety, behavioral-based safety sort of as a basic premise says, you get what you reward, you don't get what you punish. I, I can translate that into Lewin's terms. You get what the driving forces take you to, you don't get what the restraining forces take you away from. But funny thing about that premise, which makes total sense when you think about it, oh, yeah, that's perfect, right? I get what I want. I don't get what I don't want. I get what I value. I get what I reward. I don't get what I punish. Is That's not at all, not even close to at all, what Loon's research showed us. And this may be fundamental, and this may help explain at least part of the way I see the world and certainly explain part of the phenomena that you see. Because Lewin's basic premise was, and his research is pretty robust on this, it shows it pretty strongly, is that change happens not by increasing the positive, by increasing the driving forces, so do more, reward more, um, value more what you want. Change happens, Lewin's would say, by actually decreasing the negative force. So in other words, you don't reward more to get more. You actually remove the restraining forces more to get more. So let's pull that apart a little because that's a pretty interesting idea. You won't get more by rewarding behavior more. What you'll get more of is by removing the constraints and the restrictions that actually block the behavior that you want from happening. Does that make sense? Because that's, that's Lewin's entire premise to the notion of group dynamics and how groups change. And it is counterintuitive. It's not the way we've been told. In fact, it's not the way we've built safety programs. It's certainly not the way we build behavioral safety programs. And every one of you, every one of you have been in a meeting where, where somebody will say, I do what I'm rewarded for. Well, Lewin would say, yeah, man, that's probably true. But really, you do what we remove the restrictions away from in order, you, in order to get you to do the thing. I'm not confusing you, because I, I don't want to. But the premise is, is that you don't value the reward. What you value is removing the restrictions away from the behavior or outcome that you want. Let me rephrase it. When we make it easy to do the job wrong and hard to do the job right, we're mostly going to get wrong. But when we make it easy to do the job right and hard to do the job wrong, we're mostly going to get right. That 
in essence, is exactly what Lewin's research told him. And what's interesting is that has a lot to do with reward and restriction, and yet has nothing to do with reward and restriction. In fact, one of Lewin's major premises, it'll come back again, probably even in this discussion, is ultimately this idea. You don't move people, you move systems in which people reside. Sound familiar? (laughs) Have you heard it before? That is really ultimately the fundamental premise upon which I think about change and stability and philosophies and paradigms. But to do that, one of the things that Lewin talks about is that you must understand where the people are and, more importantly, what the people are doing. And so you start that premise, and this is what Bob Edwards talks about all around the world, and this is, I think, the basic premise of why learning teams, these small ad hoc learning groups are so successful, is you start by asking what the group is doing instead of asking what the group needs to be doing. And and in essence, you start by saying, how does this normally happen? What is the group normally doing? And then you've sort of beaten back the absolute seductive nature of a counterfactual argument, which is by saying, here's what they're supposed to do Here's what they're doing. Here's the gap between let's remove that gap by reward. What Lewin says is that's wrong. You have to first ask, how is the work normally done? What is the work normally doing? And if you do an investigation of some kind of event, it becomes paramount if you, if you, if you subscribe to Lewin's ideas, it becomes paramount that one of the very first things you have to understand is how is the work normally done when it doesn't fail? Because in sort of getting that snapshot of how the work is normally done before it fails, then you actually have a much, 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 much better understanding of w- what you need to learn. And, and that is, in fact, what, what Kurt Lewin talks about all the time. Once you know how the work is done, then you can begin to understand how the work got to such a place or how the event got to such a place, or how the outcome got to such a place. You want to know what the group is doing instead of knowing what the group isn't doing. That is powerful. And and the way I think about it is, is that groups are different than things. People are different than things. If you want to move a rock, you just go and move the rock, right? It's, it's, you take it from where it is, to where you want it to be, and there's not a lot of discussion, right? People are not objects. To change a person, you cannot simply move the person. To change a person, you have to actually change the system, the environment, the motivations that are around that person that got that person to where they are. It's easier and better and faster and way more effective to change the system than it is to change the behavior. And and that's because people are not objects. People have a compelling reason that somehow, some way, puts them in a position where the outcome they're getting is exactly the outcome that the system is is driving for. So I was at an organization a couple weeks ago that for the last, I don't know, eight, ten years, have had five reportable accidents a year, just in and out. One year they had four, one year they had six, five, four, four, five, five, six, 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 four, five. Average of five per year for a dozen years or so. Here's what I'm going to tell you. That group is perfectly attuned to have an organization that gets five, an average of five events per year. If they want something different, Lewin would say, you have to go in and actually change the system, but you don't change the system by rewarding workers for not getting hurt. You change the systems by removing the restrictions that are keeping workers from changing towards a better, safer, 
easier, more stable, whatever the word you want there, way to do the work. You must see what the worker sees. And this is what Bob Edwards talks about when he talks about sort of capturing the blue line or looking at it through the eyes of the worker or industrial empathy. That's a word he uses all the time. You must see the work the way the worker sees the work. And when you identify how the worker sees the work, then what happens is your question changes and you start to really think about sort of not what it is you need to change, like moving an object, moving a rock, but what system influences are in place that are creating the outcomes you're creating. I hope I didn't lose you in this conversation, but one of the important things about this conversation is that fundamental difference of those two forces, those forces that really create a system in which people can move, right? The driving force and the restraining force. And you won't get change by increasing the driving force. You get change by decreasing the restraining force. That's Kurt Lewin in a nutshell. I hope you want to know more because it's easy to find more about Kurt Lewin. I mean, just jump in there and look up Kurt and look up Rogers and look up these people and see what they're saying and then counter counter position it to what you've been told. Because part of what is a challenge for us is that the way we want to change is sort of built into folklore and not into evidence. And evidence makes us smarter. And evidence makes us more effective. And evidence helps us make change. Two forces at play. Two incredibly powerful forces at play and you manage those two forces every single day i mean that that's what you do for a living in fact that's our entire job the driving force and the restraining force kurt lewin would say don't focus on the driving force focus on the restraining force move away the things that keep workers from being successful So that's the podcast for today. What did you think? I can't emphasize enough. So therefore, I'll try to because I can't. Here I go. How important Lewin's ideas are to really more enlightened thinking around change. That it's not about making rewards for doing things well. Intrinsically, that's not terribly valuable, and people are rewarded with many, many different things. They're just many – everybody has kind of different things they look for. That ultimately what we want to do is remove the resistance away from doing things the right way. And if you think about the, the adage, if we make it easy to do it safe and hard to do it wrong, then what we mostly get are easy to do it safe. People are like water. They're they're constantly looking for the path of least resistance. And that is what Lewin says in his thinking and in his work, is that what we do is we don't reward good outcomes. We remove resistance to create good outcomes. And that premise is worth its weight in gold. I mean, it's the reason USB sticks only go in one direction. It's the reason pokey oak, right, if you're familiar with that from your manufacturing side. It's the reason we design systems to create the outcomes we create. And, and we do that by managing reward, of course, but by more importantly, removing resistance. And that is not intuitive. That is not a natural thought. Um, trying harder, being nicer is not in and of itself sufficient enough to actually facilitate change. And so that's where we are. And to me, this was a discussion that we should have had it a long time ago. I just didn't think to have it until I started thinking about uh, all the stuff we were talking about when we were talking about kind of academic bantering around who owns what and what about ideas that are true and ideas that are not true. And And that sort of brought forth the need to have this podcast. I thoroughly... Um, appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you. But more importantly, 
I really want you to take these ideas and chew on them a bit. Don't don't buy what I say. Um, that's not very satisfying. What I want to do is is get a discussion with you on what you think about these ideas. That is incredibly valuable. That's a that's a really good way to think about um, managing a, a giant shift in paradigm, which is what you do for a living. So be strong, you guys, because right now the world needs us to be fearless. No fear. Fearless, fearless, fearless. Um, have as much fun as you possibly can. Learn something new every single day. I hope today was one of those days for you. And most importantly, remember, be safe. <laughs>